Hello, hello, everyone out there in cyber world. Um, thank you for joining us tonight as we have our second installment um, with our Black Maternal Health Campaign, um, a conversation with Dr. Cooper Owens around her book, Medical Bondage. Um, I'm Ashley Spivey. I am the founder of Ivy Black Girl. We are a collective that centers Black women, fins, and girls to access our full potential and authentically be. Um, we do this through four approaches, through Give, which is collective investments and volunteerism. So you might have heard of um, our giving circle, IB Black Girl Gives, um, that has invested nearly $100,000 in Black women, feminine girl-led projects. We then have our Connect work, which um, looks at our research that we are commissioning around Black women, fems, and girls, and just space for us to get together. So anything that celebrates us and affirms us, that will live in our Connect bucket, as well as our Youth Advisory Committee, Black Girls Lead. And when I say these young people are brilliant, telling us what to do and what we should do, they are it. Um, next, we have uh, Grow, which looks at economic liberation and entrepreneurship. We've invested um, nearly 70,000 into Black women owned um, and femme owned businesses, um, as well as we have our pitch contest coming up in March. Um, and we are kicking off an incubator uh, coming soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then lastly, our take action work. And so we really, as we have evolved over these last um, two and a half years and have thought about how can we create um, transformational change at the system level for a Black women, fems, and girls, um, it really is around advocacy and organizing. And so we have decided to go deep in that space around a couple of issues, um, one being Black maternal health and the other around expanding protections around um, natural hair in the workplace and schools. And so tonight, we are super excited to be able to host Dr. Cooper Owens to one kick off Black History Month. So we're Black every day. We celebrate every day of the year, but we really Black, Black, Black this month. So I'm excited to be able to kick off this month with her talk. And again, to keep educating us around um, the importance of Black maternal health and having quality and culturally um, appropriate and relevant services um, and access. And so with that, we are going to hear from her. She is going to talk about her book, Medical Bondage. If you do not have it, go on and Google on Amazon on her website right now while we are talking. When she starts her talk, I will drop it in the chat so that y'all can see where you can pick it up. Um, but you are in for a treat as she is brilliant um, in how she connects the dots between the institution of enslavement and then gynecology, even what we are seeing um, today. And I should ask you, is my soror, so I'm even more excited to have her on this talk. Um, so Deidre Cooper Owens is the Linda and Charles Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is an organization of American historians, distinguished lecturer, a past American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists research fellow, and has won a number of prestigious honors for her scholarly and advocacy work in reproductive and birthing justice. She is the bomb, y'all. It's even more than this. I gotta, I gotta read the rest of this. A popular public speaker, Dr. Cooper Owens has spoken widely across the U.S. and Europe. She has published articles, essays, book book chapters and think pieces on a number of issues that concern African-American experience in reproductive justice. Her first book, Medical Bondage, and I got it right here because I got it with me so y'all can see them. Um, so her first book, Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology, won the 2018 Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians as the best book written in African-American women's and gender history. So when I tell y'all we come in with the heavy hitters, we come in with the heavy hitters for y'all. We're bringing in the brilliance and expertise of Black women in the field to educate us and bring us along in that journey. So without Without further ado, I am going to bring onto screen Dr. Cooper Owens. All right, you are live. I'm going to turn it over to her. We're, she's going to do a 15 to 20 minute chat. We will then open it up for Q&A. I have some questions, but feel free to use the chat box. Start to drop your questions in now as we will um, get to it after her talk. All right, it's all yours, Dr. Cooper Owens.
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ashley Spivey and IB Black Girls for having me. It is really an honor to kick off Black History Month. I, I mean, I'm a Black history professor, I'm a Black woman, and so Black History Month is a busy month, but it is one that is so important. And so it really is my honor to be able to do this with someone who I am also sharing physical space with uh, in Nebraska. Thank you all for joining um, through Facebook or you know, uh, StreamYard, whatever platform you're joining, thank you. So I'm gonna actually get started with how this book becomes so relevant in the 21st century. Because I often joke, I write about dead people and I write about people who lived in the 18th and the 19th centuries. How in the world is this applicable to a 21st century experience? And I'll be honest with you, I didn't know initially. I really didn't know. It was the work of birth workers and reproductive justice and birthing justice activists that really connected um, the dots for me. So let me start way back in 2005 when I was still a graduate student at UCLA and I was trying to figure out what in, what in the world am I going to, am I going to write about? I knew I wanted to write about uh, black women. I knew I was interested in the 19th century and, and the era of slavery, but I really didn't know. But I have always had a big mouth and I have always done public speaking ever since I was a teenager. And I was supposed to emcee a program with Janetta Cole and civil rights pioneer, Reverend James Lawson in, in Los Angeles. And so I'm doing my research and I read this book that uh, Beverly Guy Sheftel, one of the architects of um, black, feminist, black feminism and womanism scholarship at Spelman, Janetta Cole, who had been president of Spelman, she was uh, currently at, in 2005 president of Bennett College, my alma mater, the other black women's college in the US. So I read their book called Gender Talk, Talk. Literally, it was almost like just two or three sentences, but they had a little blurb on this guy named James Marion Sims, an experimental work he had done on enslaved women. And I'm thinking, wait, I went to a, a all black women's college I went to another HBCU for my master's degree in African-American studies with a history concentration. Here I was in a PhD program and I had never known that black people were a part of experimental medicine in this country, never knew that. And so I started digging and, and scratching and I discovered that in fact, there were several branches of medicine that could not have developed as quickly as it did during that time period without the experimentation and really exploitation and usage of enslaved bodies. And so it really set me on the path for doing this thing called history of medicine and reproductive medical history. And so fast forward to 2017. By this point, I'm an assistant professor working at Queens College in New York. And there was this huge controversy. Some of you may have seen the pictures that went viral, but a lot of black and brown people in East Harlem who lived very near Central Park wanted the statue of James Marion Sims, the father of American gynecology. They wanted that statue removed. And this was during the time where many young people across college campuses, usually in the South, had been protesting um, the placement of those Confederate statues. So people in the North, like in New York, ah, we're safe until folk were like, eh, eh, in Central Park. You have a James Marion Sims statue, and there is no mention of the enslaved women that he experimented on. And so in August 2017, a picture went viral of four Black women who were members of the Black Youth Project 100, the New York chapter. Uh, they had on hospital gowns. They were standing in front of the Sims statue. The hospital gowns were smeared with blood, and it became a political and artistic protest. And all of a sudden, my life changes where even my, my press said to me, we have got to ride this wave. You know, we're gonna release your book early. So my book was even released the very next month in September, as opposed to, to November. And all of a sudden my life really changed in my career. I was no longer the black history professor at Queens College. I was now the nation's foremost expert on James Marion Sims. And I and so I thought about this. I was like, do I use this opportunity to talk about the removal of the statue, which was important, especially to the community activists who had been talking about this for almost a decade? 
or do I use it in a way that really hits upon the legacy of medical racism in this country? And as all of you know, we were going through a black maternal health crisis. We're still going through a black maternal health crisis. And I was like, guess what? I ain't answering those questions about whether the statue stays or goes because whether it stays or goes, the black maternal health crisis was going to be here and we would have to contend with it. And so they would ask me those questions. What do you think? Should the statue stay or go? I was like, that's not my issue. But what I can talk about is the legacy that James Marion Sims helps to create. Because I knew most Americans don't know a lot about slavery outside of what they've seen on movies or maybe TV. Maybe they read a blog post or heard someone on YouTube. But, you know, how many people are in college classrooms taking history of American slavery classes, right? And so it was my opportunity as a professor, as a teacher, to be able to teach beyond the, the walls of academia and to be able to tell people about this history that really hadn't been amplified outside of very small kind of elite academic circles. So once the statue was removed the next year, all of a sudden birthing um, activists, reproductive justice activists, they were like, hey, we need you to come and speak to us because we didn't know that there was this past that was, you know, uh, kind of, you know, this past around gynecology and obst obstetrics that really depended upon the body of and, you know, vulnerable enslaved women. And so I told, you know, I write about the father of the C-section, Francoise uh, Marie Provoche, who leaves Paris, goes to Haiti, experiments on enslaved women there, trying to perfect the C-section, then heads off at the start of the Haitian Revolution to Louisiana. And guess what he does? He performs experimental research on enslaved women in Louisiana trying to perfect the C-section. And I was like, wait, why doesn't anybody know about him? Or Ephraim McDowell, who performs the first abdominal-based uh, surgery in the country in 1809, right? And he does so on one white patient, all five of the rest in Kentucky, no less, that didn't have hardly any Black folk. But he finds five Black women to experiment on and one dies. And so I, so that was also a part of the issue. This is a structural issue. And James Marion Sims can't be the boogeyman because then that places the blame on one person. And if we're talking about something that is systemic and structural, we have to let, I have to let folk know that he inherits a, a system and a cultural practice that already existed. He inherited and was literally handed down ideas about black people's so-called biological difference, um, Black women's inability to experience pain in childbirth or even surgery. He doesn't come up with that. That man wasn't exceptional. He, in fact, was quite ordinary to any slave-owning physician during the time. He experimented on, on enslaved people. Lots of folk like him did. He didn't use anesthesia because anesthesia really wasn't available in the 1840s. But it becomes easier in the doctor's mind to perform on these you know, people who are biologically distinctive from white folk, if they believe that, in fact, they don't manage pain in the same ways that white people do, or at least they don't feel it in, in you know, in certain cases. So all of these things I'm trying to show existed all across the Atlantic world for centuries, right? And so I then show this way in which you know, and this is the really the, the kind of mind blowing thing for a lot of people. I then show all of those things that we see in the 18th and the 19th century, the patient blaming by doctors, the seeing black people as biologically distinctive from white people, seeing black women as not experiencing pain during childbirth, um, you know, not believing them when they tell doctors about their symptoms, their pains. All of a sudden that becomes replicated in the 20th century and in the 21st century. And I remember a dear colleague of mine who's also a historian of, of, of US slavery and medicine, Charlotte Fett, we were asked to uh, co-author a piece for the American Journal, uh, the Journal, excuse me, of um, American Journal of Public Health, excuse me. So we wrote this, this kind of um, piece, you know, talking about the past and the, the present, you know, highlighting the black maternal crisis. And, 
I remember one of the reviewers, because it has to go through this, you know, anonymous reviewing process. But I remember this person said, are you sure the stats are the same for Black maternal morbidity and mortality during the age of slavery in the 21st century? And we're like, oh, yeah, we got receipts. In fact, boom, here's the footnote, right? And so that is the thing. As much as the field has advanced, the numbers are the same. Literally, the numbers are the same. The other thing is, in in slavery, and this is the ironic thing, in slavery, there is a concerted effort by the government, by slave owners, to protect the reproductive health of enslaved women, not because they're compassionate, but because they know that the institution of slavery is literally bound up in the the wounds of enslaved women. When freedom comes, the vested interest is gone because no longer are black women thought to be assets, right? They're not investments. They are seen as financial burdens in freedom. And so all of a sudden you start to see criticisms of the very thing that white folk and, and, and I mean this in terms of kind of the slave owning, um, you know, historians call them the slaveocracy, right? These folk who are writing about, oh, you know, there's such ease with reproduction, right? They're, the fecundity um, or the ability to get pregnant and reproduce is, is really easy for these people. Or, oh, yes, they're sexually irresponsible and loose, right? The thing is, though, you didn't mind all of that when they were birthing these babies that, that represented wealth. But all of a a sudden in freedom, they're irresponsible baby mamas, right? They're welfare queens. In fact, people are having hysterectomies done on them without their consent or knowledge. You know, uh, many of you have heard about the Mississippi appendectomies. There are several cases, the Ralph, Ralph sisters in Mississippi, Fannie Lou Hamer spoke about hers. We remember the ways that nor plant was inserted in uh, black and brown and poor women who uh, and birthing people who uh, lived in in these you know urban enclaves, especially in the 80s and the early 90s, right? And we think about what happened in Puerto Rico. And so there's something about freedom and the devaluation of black bodies that starts to show the, that there are cracks in the structure, right? And so by the time you roll into the 21st century, we now find that the United States is the most dangerous place for Black women and Black birthing people, right, in all of the developed world, developed world, the most dangerous place to have a baby. Nationally, Black women and Black birthing people are three to four times more likely to suffer from pregnancy complications and also death than white women and white birthing people. And when you look at certain places like Brooklyn, I lived there until last year, Brooklyn, New York. Um, There are spaces in Detroit, Pittsburgh, uh, Cleveland and Cincinnati. Even Omaha has disproportionately higher numbers of uh, black birthing people who suffer from, uh, you know, maternal morbidity and mortality, infant morbidity and mortality. And so, you know, for me, it really is about how do we stop really the deaths and the, the sicknesses of the most vulnerable population when it comes to, to, to people who give birth, right? I am always trying to change the conversation so that we don't look at um, this particular population as just objects of study, objects of disdain, but really subjects, right, who are human, and who we need to save their lives, extend love to, and listen to. And so my 15 minutes is up. I'm gonna stop here, Um, but I do welcome your comments and your questions. Thank you so much. All right, so that was like, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. That was so impactful and so powerful, and I have so many questions. Um, So I'm going to start asking them to our folks that are viewing on Facebook and YouTube. We can see your chat. I have it on my other screen as well, so feel free. Um, There's some stuff on Twitter happening, so feel free to tweet us questions, um, ask in the chat on the video questions, and we will make sure that they get asked. Um, 
So I want to start out by first, um, in your book, as I was reading, I got all my highlights, y'all, because I was I was into this. Um, you, you have a statement that says medical bondage is not so much about historical recovery as it is about the holistic retrieval of own women's lives outside of the hospital bed. And that something with that just sat with me. And so could you expound a little bit more of what you meant when you put that in uh, to the book? This is, thank you for saying that. It's really interesting when I, so I told you all, I started in 2005, right? As a, as a grad student, you don't know what it's actually going to become because, you know, I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know. And here I was, gee whiz, 12 years later, 13 years later, finishing up a book, or I should say, what's that? Two, 11 years later, I was finishing up the book and I was going through in vitro um, IVF, in vitro fertilization. And I remember the way I was treated. I write about that in the, in the afterword of the book. And I remember I found out from the doctors that my cervix didn't have an opening. So the technical, the medical term, I had never heard it was cervical stenosis. And so he says, I have to dilate your cervix. Okay, fine. But he does so without any anesthesia. And that literally meant for 15 minutes, um, he takes the, the speculum that people use for pap smear. He inserts his hand. He's holding my cervix and he takes a long metal brush and he bores a hole into my cervix for 15 minutes. And it was the worst pain I've ever, ever experienced in my life. And about two weeks later, he does it again. And it was in those moments of writing about enslaved women, where even in my own naivete, I'm thinking, surely we're not experiencing this. And then here I was, the subject of, of this. And so in the, in the back of the book, I remember using this term by a, a Black woman theorist that I, I admire her work so much. Her name is Hortense Spillers, but she talks about being a marked woman. And although I wasn't thinking of myself in that way. I remember after having to write certain things that you're talking about and being reflective, I saw myself as, you know, being a representative of those women um, who were unable to tell their stories. And so I really tried to, to be respectful um, because they didn't leave written testimonies for us. So I had to go through the words of the men who owned them and who experimented on them and find the humanity and the compassion through these black women's actions. Um, and so I wanted to be a vessel for that. So that's really why I wrote it, because I was also going through my own reproductive experience um, during the time that I could have never thought, you know, would happen when I first started this research project. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. I, you know, it's interesting that you say that um, even with Ivy Black Girl getting into this space of repro justice and Black maternal health of my own experiences, we had um, a roundtable last week and we had a woman um, named Tasha, who's a part of our Black maternal health campaign, talk about her experience of having um, her daughter and then having issues with her C-section, waking up and she did not have, no longer had her reproductive system and could not um, have children. And what that experience was like for her to almost lose her life and just kind of all the things that you named to unpack within this system. And you don't necessarily see yourself as a marked woman or, or a part of that experience. But um, when you sit and reflect, I think we are. And it's, um, it's hard to, to, I think, sit with that when you think about us being one of the richest countries, right? A developed you know, country, as you said, um, but Black women are still having these experiences. So kind of to that, one of the questions in the chat, as we're thinking about it, um, you, you are, you're a medical historian, right? But you're also a reproductive justice mm -hmm. um, advocate. So when you think about what you have seen and have um, written about historically still showing up now present day, what should be black what should black women be doing as we are talking to our gynecologists or trying to navigate um, reproductive health in general? Like what what do you think that should look like for us? Yeah, thank you. I see that's Regina Wilson who asked mm -hmm. that question. And it's kind of going to go into Christian Mentor's question as well about yeah. curriculum. So the conversations we should we should be having um, is to ask about, you know, ask things like, you know, I've read that Black women uh, stress impacts 
Black women's bodies, right? In particular ways, what are my cortisol level readings? Ask those questions, right? Because typically when you enter into rest, it's supposed to be a restorative phase where your body is recovering. But because of the ways that stress impacts us and the stress comes from, you know, I mean, psychologists have done every study you can think of and they found that the kinds of racial experiences we have literally, you know, manifest in our bodies through higher cortisol levels. So ask about that. If you can, if you live in a space that has, um, you know, patient advocates, see if you can get a patient advocate. It's sometimes hard to get an independent one. So you might have to get one affiliated with the, uh, with the hospital, but you get a patient advocate and you make sure it's think of them. Think of that person as a doula. You make sure that you tell that person, right, what is wrong with you, um, what your questions are, what your family history is, if you know it, you know, and, and have that person advocate for you. The other thing is you can go to a number of websites um, by Black reproductive justice organizations, Sister Song, doula organizations, Mama Glow, Ancient Song, doula, even the March of Dimes. Stacey Stewart is the national director. She is doing so much around Black maternal health and morbidity right now. Um, so I would say go to those places. They often have um, questions and resources that can guide those kinds of conversations for you. Um, in terms of curriculum development, that's a part of the advocacy that I'm doing. I have, I'm now working with ACOG. I work with a number of um, healthcare institutions and medical colleges, you know, in particular, I work with right now, I'm doing um, historical consultation for a scientific brand that is uh, woman owned. It's a PhD from Duke, but she is literally trying to do away with the fallacies of and fictions around racial difference and showing that, in fact, women or trans men who require birth control actually need birth control based on their own individual genetic makeup, not some fictionalized, oh, this person is Chinese or Vietnamese or, or Black or any of those kinds of things, because those biological differences don't really, they don't exist. And so I'm doing that kind of work too, around language, around education. So I'm only one person though. So what I would say is you know, the more that you find out about work that I've done, there's a scholar who wrote a book called Reproductive Injustice, Dinah Ieen Davis, um, Loretta Ross, who was one of the Black women to coin um, reproductive justice in 1994. Go out and look for our work. Even if you do an Amazon search, the books will come up. I promise you, the books will come up. And that's another way that you can say to, especially if you are in school, I mean, I recognize that there are power dynamics, but you can say, hey, you know, um, I know this is, you know, a core competency, but somehow this is reading to me like maybe some, I don't know, cultural insensitivity or it's based on stereotypes. You know, here are some studies. And so in this regard, Google and Amazon <laughs> searches can literally be your best friend. Thank you for that. So I just want to name really quick that if you go to the Ivy Black Girl website, so ivyblackgirl.com, under our Take Action tab, you'll see information around our Black Maternal Health Campaign. Some of the resources that Dr. Cooper Owens named around finding doulas, Sister Song, other reproductive rights organizations that are doing things on the national scale. We have those listed there. We also have some happenings of what we're trying to advocate in Nebraska. So um, Christian actually is on our Black Maternal Health Working Group, um, and she was on the roundtable last week. And we've been talking about that um, around what can we do to impact that system around how doctors and other medical practitioners um, are taught and are conditioned within their, you know, their studies because we see it showing up there. So for the plug for all y'all out there, just know that I'm on Dr. We're almost like y'all want to join our you want to join our black maternal health working group. We need you. Um, so we are going to tap into her brilliance whenever she has time and the capacity. Um, but there are some things happening that you can get engaged with. So go visit our page um because that information is there. So before we get to the other couple questions that are coming in the box uh in the chat, I want to go back to something that I have uh, started to read in the book. Also, if you scroll up, I will rejop the chat or the, the link in there to her book. So I will do that as she's answering this question. So y'all can order it um and, and also Google search other related um uh 
books. But you talked about um, Black super bodies um, in your book and you talked about what did that look like. And so I don't want to spoil it, but mm -hmm. could you give some insight to what you meant and what that term Black super body means? Yeah, it's, you know what, it is the, it, so, you know, when you're in grad school, you have to come up with what they call theoretical interventions and come up with these fancy titles for things that we already know. And essentially it was my fancy way of saying black women have stereotypically and historically been thought of as stronger. And so I'm saying, well, if you make somebody do physical labor, like if you are a domestic or field slave, yeah, you're going to have more muscular development. That doesn't mean that you're, you know, stronger biologically, right? Because this is the this is the weird thing about that kind of medical super bodies. It's almost like two sides of the same coin. So the very fact that you think black women are stronger, right? That they're exceptional in terms of not experiencing pain, being able to get pregnant easier. But then there is the flip side where you will also say, "Oh, they have a state of arrested development intellectually. They're not as smart, right? Or um, they're guided by their emotions, you know, because also they're women, so they're a subset of men. And so it really is kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And so we see that today in the ways that even the medical super body has been <laughs> placed or mapped upon black children who were just born. Um, you know, in the book Re Reproductive Injustice, I was mentioning she does a whole study of Black pregnant um, women and birthing people. And after birth, a lot of you who might be nurses um, or, or MDs, you've probably heard about this, the strong Black boy myth, that somehow Black boys are stronger than other babies. And I'm like, wait, how is the baby in NICU? <laughs> like they're in NICU, but they're somehow stronger. I mean, it's the same racial cognitive dissonance where people you know, were saying through these experiments, oh, black people and white people are different, but you're doing the same surgical experimentations on black people to find cures for white folk. It doesn't make sense, right? Because if they were really different, you'd be doing the experimentation on white women, but you're doing it on black, black women because you know they have the same reproductive organs, the services, the cervix, right? And so and I think you name that in your book of even like putting yeah. some like the organs on display. You don't know whose organ it is. It's just a, it's just a survey. Right. And so that's kind of, you know, for me, being able to also expose what's right there in front of us. And I would often get this question when I first started giving talks and people were like it just doesn't make sense. Right. And I was like, well, you know, it's like telling folk, guess what? Black people actually don't use illegal substances more than white people. And every statistic has borne that out. And yet when you say it, the face of crack has become black. The face of weed has become black. The, you know, the face of cigarettes have become black. And every study over the past four or five decades have shown that black people do not even abuse alcohol, right? In the same ways or overuse those substances in the ways that white Americans have, but we've become the face of pathology. And so the racial cognitive dis dissonance is you can show facts but people kind of believe either illustrations or images. And so they will forget the, the text, the facts, and kind of believe what has been fed to them. And so, yeah, so that's where medical super bodies came in. Yeah, that's great. So um, I'm I'm getting all my fancy stuff together um, with, uh, with StreamYard. I'm liking this. Um, but Dr. Sophia, so she is a reproductive justice advocate. Love her. She does amazing work. She's at University of Nebraska, Omaha. And her question is around how can non-Black women of color better support Black pregnant and birthing people navigating their prenatal care and birthing options? Um, as I mentioned, she's a public health professor and pregnancy and birth is a passion area, but the vast amount of her work in, is in research and education. So she feels a little bit more removed from that. So how are there any suggestions around that allyship or advocacy that you could see happening for uh, women of color that do not identify as Black? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so that's interesting. I think doing what you're doing, the research piece is important. Let me tell you something. I, I am not the kind of go out in the street with the bullhorn kind of person. So I stay in my lane. I stay in my little black nerdy lane. And so I can do research. I can write about it. And I have, a, and I'm just going to pat myself on, on the back. I have a really great way of not using a whole lot of jargon. And even when I do, I will always make it accessible. So I think 
speaking out is important. So whatever it is, if you are that research person, keep doing the important research because that's so needed. Those are the things that people like me and Ashley and all of you, right? We need that when we're trying to advocate. Also, I would say in these institutional spaces, be sure to call out gatekeeping that keeps out certain folk or that don't see value in hiring them and accepting them as assistants. Um, expanding our relationship with vendors. And so by that, I mean, if you know that you need um, a consulting organization to come and help, think about a black owned, black managed, black woman one. Like, so all of those ways you can do, and just having doctors, having conversations with MDs um, and nurses, you know, to say, you need to listen to your patients, period. Point blank. You need to listen to your patients. Um, black folk are not even asking for some separate treatment. What we're saying is if every other person in this country isn't dying or suffering complications in the ways that Black women and Black birthing people are, do that. Whatever you do for them, do it for us. Absolutely. It's magical. We're just saying equal treatment, equity. That's literally what we're saying. And having more than 5% um, MDs in the nation, I think, would help. So expanding um, admissions of people of color. Uh, and this will be my last statement on that. Um, what is interesting, Rachel Hardiman, who is a black woman out of the University of Minnesota, just had an article published in the Washington Post January 8th of this year, not 20 years ago, this year, where she found that when black women and black birthing people have babies um, by black doctors, doulas, or midwives, the black maternal morbidity rate, uh, maternal morbidity and mortality rates are cut in half. Literally, I just I read that, yeah, and we share that on our social too, yeah. yeah. In half, that is important to note. So that means it's not race; it is racism. In fact, anti-black racism that mm -hmm. is what's causing these these uh, damning statistics. Absolutely. Um, so a couple of questions and I just want to name for folks, we're going to kind of move through. So we might not be able to get through all of them. Um, but uh, Andrea Jones talked about what could uh, youth advocates do. And so I do want to pin um, and answer this question. And then we'll move to the next one um, that we have uh, through the, our partnership with Women's Fund. So Ivy Black Girl is a fiscally sponsored program of the Women's Fund of Omaha. Um, they are showing up as allies in this space. They are a white led women's organization. They recognize that and have said, what can we do to make sure that we're uh, lifting up specifically black women's leadership and vision in this space? And so they have um, a really great fellowship and information around adolescent health. And so they have workshops, cool swag, opportunities to engage. We have a youth advisory committee um, that's also in that space. So I would say check out our website um, specifically around that, because I think a part of this work is allowing our young people to have choice and education of how they build their muscles and their perspectives around what we're talking about. We don't want to just dictate this is the way that you think about it, but allow them to go on their own learning journey. And then they can deploy their, their, um, their leadership themselves, because they'll do it. We just need to give them that opportunity. So, um, Andrea, I would suggest checking out the Women's Fund of Omaha's page around adolescent health and then our Black Girls Lead um, space as well. Um, kind of skipping down to what you, you, you kind of talked about this, uh, Dr. Cooper Owens, around what hospitals um, can do. So I just want to pin right now from the information from our roundtable last week that mm -hmm. there are two bills currently introduced into the legislature. So one by um, Michaela Kavanaugh, the other by Tony Vargas. Um, Senator Kavanaugh's bill is a reintroduction from her bill from last session that really looks at how do you center Black women into the maternal health space? Um, expanding some coverages, 12 months postpartum, and then um, expanding co coverages to doulas. And so those are the pieces of the bill that we are advocating for, as well as talking about currently um, in committee. They just had a hearing. Um, as of today, I have not checked, but uh, Senator Vargas's bill does not have a date, but it looks at the kind of restructuring of the 
Maternal Mortality Review Committee. And so if you go on our website, there's information around those um, committees. And what we have found, and I, Dr. Cooper Owens, I, I kind of want to get your um, insight to this as a, an expanded part of Sophia's question of, we know that these committees exist within these institutions to look at some of the data. So I'd be Black Girl is saying we really need to look at morbidity, um, severe maternal morbidity, those near-death experiences, because we experience those 2.1 times more than other folks folks. Um, and, you, and for us, if you center Black women and birthing folks or folks with reproductive systems in this conversation, there will be ripple effects for everyone because we're disproportionately affected. So outside of um, looking at like the prenatal collaborations or this, you know, review committees around maternal deaths or morbidity, are there any other opportunities within these systems that you think we need to be addressing? Like at the system level, here's where we got to have that entry point if we want to see movement. Yeah. So when I speak to hospital systems about this, because they're like, what can we do? We have these dismal figures. I'm like, so two things. Are you inviting people from the community onto these task force? Because you found me and you're in New Jersey or you know Iowa or Connecticut and I'm in Nebraska. So you found me. You could you could type in and find my name. What about the people who you're serving? Are they on those boards? Because these are the people that you're supposed to be, you know, advocating and caring for as, as doctors and as nurses and as hospital executives. The other thing is, and they typically get a little quiet. I'm like, you need to put something punitive in place. Because just as every, you know, every university I've ever worked in, most of the jobs that you have, when people keep, I'm, I'm going to use this language because this is the best word I know. When people keep fucking up. Excuse my French. There are say it. <laughs> when people keep fucking up, we can find ways to punish that person. If you know that these doctors and these nurses literally have a history of treating patients disrespectfully, you know the kinds of conversations they're having during surgeries, you know when they're rushing people, you know what they're writing in those charts. What punitive system is in place to make sure that they do not just get transferred, but that they are about to lose their license? The one thing I know as a historian of U.S. history, in no way has any oppressive system or person ever said, hey, I'll give up power because I just want things to be fair and I really care about you. Typically, wars have happened. So there was a revolutionary war, the Civil War, some kind of uprising in some place or some massive, something has had to happen in order for people to change. And it is not because they had a change of heart. So yes, education, but we need to have a system of checks and balances where those folk are taken out and we bring in people who actually care about, and that's the thing, it's medical care, it's patient care. Who are the people who care about the patients? Get out those rotten apples. I don't care if they lose their jobs, if they lose their licenses. They need to because literally people's lives are hanging in the balance, right? Absolutely. Those are the two things that I really want to advocate. Community, um, you know, community integ integration and also a punitive system that is put in place for people who keep breaking the rules and killing folk, literally. Absolutely. So with that, um, we've also been in conversation around pushing around the data points with some of these committees, changing the composition of not just having medical practitioners, but like you said, community-based folks with lived experience in those identities to be in these spaces. Um, and there's some conversation, we won't get to it now. Uh, so Jana is on here. She is one of our Black Girl Leads participants, and she had a question around um, a diversity course um, mm -hmm. being added. And so right now, that is is a part of Senator Kavanaugh's bill around having a diversity course. Um, I can say from the amazing Black women that are on our working group, mm -hmm. we have taken the stance that um, it has to be a yes and. So if you're going to have this course, it can't be a checkbox. They've done this implicit bias or whatever. And now we have solved for anti-Blackness and institutional racism in this field. But what is that long-term system change from how folks are educated around medicine? What is the reconciliation mm -hmm. of the harm that needs to happen um, and that continues to happen in order for us to see change? And so um, do you think that, or do you have any thoughts around having a course or having long-term um, insight to that, um, to that piece that uh, John is wondering? Yeah. So yes, I do think that there needs to be, um, it, it shouldn't even be seen as a kind of supplemental course. It, it should just be a part mm -hmm. of 
you know, regular coursework. Um, so yes, I certainly think so. I also think that there has to be something that is, you know, integrative in terms of what this education means. So, you know, on the very superficial level, introducing people to concepts, you know, that they may not be uh, aware of, um, having some accountability within that institution, you know, for how to make medical practitioners in particular um, more cognizant of their own biases and not using kind of old school data, but like things from the 21st century, right? The UVA study, there are Harvard studies, there are studies from the University of Chicago that you can pull from the 21st century that are like, hey, people are coming in with ideas around anti-Blackness or they're anti-woman. And so how do we change these kinds of things? So yes, I do think those kinds of modules and, and learning tools need to be in place, but there also has to be, what's the end result from that education? And the end result has to be the policy change, right? Um, which really is a part of policy changes come from the education piece. And so it has to be, I think, connected to policy change because that's ultimately what's going to save, you know, these people's lives. Um, so, yeah, I do think they should be required to take it. And every year I know at my job, I have to take like workplace sexual harassment. <laughs> and so I have to fill it out. And sometimes you're like, oh, my gosh. But you realize like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm somebody who's certified. I'm supposed to report these things. And now with COVID, we have to take this every semester. I have to know the right language to use. Am I self-isolating? Am I quarantining? And those are not things I thought about until I had to take those tests. Right. Mm -hmm. So the education, I think, is, is really good. Um, it can wear on us, but that's OK. There are lots of things that fatigue us and we and we survive. We figure it out. Right. We survived it. It's fine. Okay, so we are at time. I have a bill, bazillion other questions I want to ask. We did not get to some of the questions in the chat, but I promise y'all we're going to bring her back because she is brilliant and you, I, I mean, I feel really energized. And so I know the folks can feel your passion and your energy, and just your brilliance to really keep um, mobilizing this work. So I do want you to kind of have one question to leave us on. Mm -hmm. um, and that is... Um, are Black women the mothers of gynecology? So given the history of what you wrote, what we experienced through kind of the birth of this field um, and how that is um, kind of married to the institution of enslavement, do you feel like we have birthed what you see now today as calling gynecology? Yeah, because I mean, the earliest, every doctor I named in the book, you know, starting with some of the experimental surgeries that were happening even during the colonial period, they were done on enslaved women and largely because those bodies were not their own. And so they were owned bodies that these men had access to. These were the most vulnerable bodies. So it doesn't mean that it didn't happen to poor white women or, you know, women in lunatic asylums, as they were called, or, or jails. But in terms of the magnitude, um, when we think about just the kind of numerical um, data, Yes, they are. And I think in the case of James Marion Sims, the father of American gynecology, he even wrote about, you know, when his white, two white medical surgical assistants left him, he had to train his enslaved patients, right, to serve as nurses and surgical assistants. And I often joke that it was interesting. The white men who left him were literate and they were elite because they were working to become doctors mm -hmm. under this man. The black women who assisted him, who were also the experimental patients, were illiterate and enslaved. And they were the surgical team that helped this man to, quote unquote, perfect this surgical technique that's still being used today. Right. So a group of unlearned. Right. And I just mean by the written word, black women who were owned were the ones who pushed him into success. So, yeah, they literally were the mothers of gynecology because it was through their practical um, you know, kind of practical work and practical know-how um, that helped usher in this in this field as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper Owens. I am, uh, I mean, again, I am buzzing. We appreciate your brilliance. I don't know if you can still see the chat, but people have tons of comments and love for you. We are so excited that one, you're in Nebraska, so don't leave too soon, please. 
this no. we got some, we got some work to do so we need you here um and again we are we are excited to be able to invite you back into the work of Ivy Black Girl and, and engage in the work that you're leading so thank you for your your effort again and your brilliance and vision um for all the folks that are out there and still watching please visit our website it's going across the bottom again I like this little stream yard I feel like I'm doing all this fancy tech stuff uh for this presentation um but visit our website we have a page dedicated under our Take Action tab around Black maternal health. Um, this work is being led by Black women. Um, we are centering Black women and folks with reproductive systems into this work. Um, and we are just excited to make movement in Nebraska. And so thank you again for your time on this evening. I want y'all to stay safe, wear a mask, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.